Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. something and started fading it in underneath. I just, I, I just played something and started fading it in underneath. Ladies and gentlemen, it's frame rate, the most amazing thing we've ever produced we think you're gonna love it episode 150 i'm tom merritt with all the enthusiasm of a british sports enthusiast tom <laughs> merritt ushers in a new era of oh, excitement see, I was to going frame for rates. apple i was going for an apple announcement <laughs> oh no no no! i totally read to be like bbc hey beautiful people i'm brian brushwood and that opening segment was brought to you by dan voiles that was a vine he posted titled the things i have to endure Watching frame rate, Brian Brush and Tom Merritt. You, if you're not watching the <laughs> video this time, audio <laughs> listeners, be very glad. Be very. You're, you're yeah. missing out, sirs. Yeah. Uh, uh, should we even describe what uh, it is? We should make them go find no, it. Just uh, go go to the show notes and you can click on the vine. <laughs> Don't want to look at it. Uh, uh, hey, this is amazing. frame rate. It's the show that thinks you ought to be able to watch what you want, whether it's a cat like in its butt or not, when you want, where you want, <laughs> however many times you want on whatever device you want. And we're here to give you all that information starting each week. Brian Brushwood with the big story. This just in the big story. Reuters had a big, long article about Intel and their OnQ service. We still don't have official word that they've sold it, but this continued to say that, yeah, Intel wants to get rid of it. And essentially, the upshot of this article is Intel under Paul Odellini was going to make a big push this year. And that's where all that retail space you may have heard of that are going to be Intel stores this, holly, this holiday season in New York came from. They were supposed to be OnQ stores showing you how great the Intel OnQ TV system was going to be. Brian Krasanich came in as the new CEO in the summer and said, yeah, we're, we're not good at this, you guys. Let's, let's jettison it. Let's get it out of there. Uh, and so thereby setting back the cord cutting industry by untold months possibly years yeah so as you read this article tom uh how uh, i couldn't help as i went through essentially just you doing check boxes against what happened versus what we thought happened how close do you think we were with our conjecture over why the whole thing crumbled based after, yeah, after I, you read this I, well i feel like we got pretty close but then i also have selective memory so maybe we didn't that's but fine i like that's, to that's think totally got- fine I'd like to think we got pretty close because I felt like it was a tall order. It was something they were going to have a hard time getting deals. And that when Brian Krasanich came in and immediately poured cold water on it, that he was saying, this is not what we do well and was trying to figure out how to get out of it. And that seems to be exactly what happened uh, is that Odalini believed, let's throw some cash at the problem. Let's make this happen. And Krasanich was less excited about it, less enthusiastic. Well, especially when you see how deeply entrenched this industry is. I mean, I mean, you're looking at a a fully mature 60, 65 year old industry with with a lot of deeply entrenched BS in all of its agreements. Uh, I, I, I mean, the whole thing that excited us about the Intel experiment was the fact that they were outsiders. And ultimately, that was also the exact same thing that essentially doomed it. Would you say is right? Yeah, exactly. Well, yes and no. I mean. I think what doomed it is they changed CEOs, right? I think what happened is uh, they had a CEO who was willing to take a chance, willing to take a crazy risk. Uh, and maybe knowing he was on on the way out, he thought, he's like, yeah, might as well. Give it a shot. Let's make this thing happen. And you need somebody with that attitude. And in fact, I think Apple is suffering from that because Steve Jobs may have been able to make this happen, but we don't have him anymore either. You need somebody who's willing to fly in the face of all these risks. And Brian Krasenich very reasonably is not willing to do that. But this is the kind of situation where none of the entrenched interests want to make this happen fast. 
In fact, right. they, they're resisting making it happen at all. They would like to keep it under control. They would like to do to it what the industries did to color movies and FM radio again. Mm -hmm. And you need somebody who can go to battle and kind of just pull with the, perp the force of their vision and personality bust through all of that resistance. And we don't have a person like that right now. Yeah, I and I don't know really what the answer is for them. You know, it was uh, so far we've seen inside players attempt to play the game and fail. And then we saw, you know, we got all excited because Intel were the outsiders trying to come in. I mean, are we just doomed to, if not be stuck with cable, be stuck with something that looks an awful lot like it? I'm thinking if what we want, if what you want as an individual is somebody to come in and make the box that does it all that says you're not gonna lose anything. You're gonna get ABC, CBS, NBC, HBO, and Netflix and Amazon, and here it is. I think that may be doomed. That's that's gonna be an end result of a long and arduous well, process. I think yeah, instead, I, I, what we're going to see is a battle where they have said, we're not gonna make our stuff easily available. We're gonna to try to keep people watching television. And so you're seeing Netflix, Amazon, Hulu create their own uh, competing programs. I think you're going to see more and more of that. And I think, in fact, another big story, not, not that we're ready to switch yet, but another big story sheds some light on what else is being encouraged to do that. Yeah. Okay. Well, let, let, let me make my prediction right now. And keep okay. in mind, this is just where I'm at right now. This doesn't, you know, I'm not, don't set this in platinum or nothing. Uh, I honestly feel like we are on track to get what we want aesthetically. Uh, stuff like, and we'll talk about the Xbox One later on. I think the Xbox One really could come in oh, and be the one box to rule you them say all. It that way, that's an interesting point. You're right. Yeah. But but I think that we'll never be allowed to give up that stupid eighty dollars a month. Like somehow the cable industry is going to figure out the way to keep extracting its fees to the country club. And um, uh, I mean that that's where I'm at right now. But I don't know that for a fact at all. Well, let's go on to another big story because I think it. it actually shed some light on this. <clears throat> Stop everything. It's another big story. Katie Couric has struck a deal to become Yahoo's global news anchor. Marissa Meyer, the CEO of Yahoo, says that Katie will be the face of Yahoo on video. She will do interviews. She will continue to do her daytime talk show, Katie, which airs on ABC. Uh, but she will become the video face of Yahoo. And remember, they've they've stolen top talent, stolen or hired away, top talent from the New York Times, like David Pogue, to become their news team. And Katie Couric is now the anchor of that. They're calling her global anchor. And the reason I think this ties into the previous story is what Yahoo's doing, what Marissa Meyer is doing, is saying there's a new world out there, right? You don't have to keep your television station, your radio station, and your newspaper separate. We can be all three. So let's have the best of the New York Times, the best of television. We can argue whether Katie's that or not, but but she's certainly in the league, right? Uh, and, and let's make one unified system here. And to me, the reason I think this ties in is it's another example of someone saying, hey, industry, you're not going to get it right. We're just going to make it on our own because we don't think we can fail. Maybe they will fail, but they don't, they don't, they're not afraid of failing. So they're willing to just give it a try. Okay, so let me let me present two different sides of the argument here. First, let me say how this is an idiotic expenditure with no tangible benefit for Yahoo. Katie Kirk is not a name or a presence that's going to pull people away from existing platforms to go join the Yahoo bandwagon. This is not as if they got Keith Olbermann or stole away somebody from you know, what are the heavy hitters at Fox News or whatever? Those people are, or Glenn Beck or whatever. There is I no don't know dedicated. About that, Brian. Maybe not Katie to Corey all Cole. demos. To some demos, Katie is that though. Okay, well, so let me let me present the alternate side. Sure, sure. Uh, this is a brilliant play for Yahoo because oh, while Katie Couric uh, isn't going to grab people and bring them over, she is the face of polished AAA class entertainment television. She looks like TV. She acts like TV. She knows TV backwards and forwards. And if what Yahoo wants to do is look like a legitimate news platform, then you couldn't do better than by grabbing Katie Couric. 
I think Katie does have more of a of an of a following than you give her credit for. I think she, in fact, Keith Olbermann is a great example of that. A lot of people out there have no idea who Keith Olbermann is. Maybe they've heard of him. Some people don't even know he was a sports broadcaster. Uh, and I think more people know who Katie Couric is simply because she anchored CBS Evening News for a while, and there was a lot of press about her. She had that famous interview with Sarah Palin. So I do think that she brings a little bit more to it than maybe you're giving her credit for, but not in all demos. Definitely. It's not like the old days where it would be like a Walter Cronkite, right? It's not like that at all. Uh, so, so you're right in that it does lend her, lend Yahoo a patina of old style respectability to have somebody like her there. But I, I really still, I believe that what we're headed for is a world where right now you have the upstarts like Netflix and the Amazons making their videos in opposition. And then you have the digital arms of say an AMC uh, or, or the digital arms of a sci-fi network who make their stuff, but they're in the shadow of the main. And as cord cutting continues, as people don't even cut the cord, maybe, let's say they leave the cord, they get tricked into leaving the cord by all these specials and deals, but they start watching more. It's not about cord cutting in that case, it's about eyeballs. And all the eyeballs start going to the web. That's always been the, the, the holdup is like, well, but the people aren't watching over there, right? They're going to start to, and they're going to continue to, to watch at ever-increasing levels. Suddenly, those digital arms, those digital sides of businesses are going to be more and more important, and they will start to lead certain networks. And they will yeah, start to devote originals to digital because that's where the people are. I think that's the alternative that we're headed for is not a grand unification, but a, a wave, a title shift, if you will. Well, and that's the question is, is the reason to get somebody as expensive and as prominent as Katie Couric is if you believe that uh, that your platform has the ability. The reason somebody like Katie appeals to so many people is because she's so neutral. She hits the middle of, of that bell curve. And uh, but but the problem is those days are kind of gone now. We're looking at the days of infinite splintering. For example, my daughter's yes, I downstairs. I mean, for example, downstairs. Uh, there was a poignant moment just minutes before we went live and it didn't end up happening, but the SpaceX launch was about to happen. My friends, Andrew Maine and Justin Robert Young are live there on the on the scene. Yeah, I was watching so that too. to share that with my daughters, I went downstairs and I opened up two feeds. I opened Justin and Andrew's feed live over Ustream that I put on the left side of the screen and I opened up the official SpaceX feed on the right. And I was all excited because, you know, we'll be able to watch both and get the, the experience and we'll feel this attachment to it. And I realized... This is the, uh, neither of my kids had ever watched a live launch of anything before. And I realized that, you know, that's less a statement about the, 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 uh, the whole humness of launching to space nowadays and more a statement about the fact that, um, that we don't have this one channel where some programmer somewhere decides this is what the people want to watch and then it gets fed to them. And instead we have this massive splintering. And I don't know if maybe maybe 10,000 people were watching on the SpaceX feed or whatever, which in the world of television is an extraordinarily small micro slice. But it didn't feel like that to us there in that room. It felt special and precious and unique. And um, in that regard, that's what I don't understand about the Katie Couric move is that uh, that's what you do if you want to be everything to everyone. You get a beige personality like that. And, um, and, I, and in that regard, I, I don't follow it. And, and I know you disagree with that, that, that presumption on my part. Well, it, and you may or may not be right. I don't know. I don't think that's what Yahoo is thinking. I don't think they're like, let's appeal to everybody. I think what they're thinking is Katie Couric plays really well amongst this demo. And oh, Here's our Yahoo News and our previous partnership with ABC News and our demo there. And I see an overlap. Fans of one are fans of the other. Now we've got the New York Times to deliver some punchy, hard-hitting news topics here. Let's bring in that audience as well. And we can sell the bejesus out of this. Because remember, even though you're not wrong about the niche audiences, there's also still mass audiences on the internet, and it will still be there. It will never be as big as it used to be, but there will still be these big, like, I love a mass personality audiences, at least for a while, as the population ages, and Yahoo has them. We, free, we talk about the decline of Yahoo, and Yahoo's not important. Yahoo is still one of the top 10 internet properties because people go there, and they read Yahoo News in droves, and that's where hiring Katie Couric makes sense. Not because it's going to capture us or the startup audience or the next wave, but it captures those people and keeps them there that Yahoo already has. And for the first time ever for that crowd, 
gives them an alternative on the internet that they might be interested in watching. Nobody's done that before. All right, Tom, you've done it. You've convinced me. I believe that the future is on the internet and everyone who has a channel on cable needs to make the leap now because that's where all the gold is. I'm sure there's no story that you're about to tell me that will shake my faith. No, sir. We can safely move into the slipstream segment. HBO Nordic, the champion of, hey, Let's get HBO on the internet without having to have a cable subscription is crappy. <laughs> Just in its numbers. Uh, according, to, yeah, uh, according to a recent MMS consumer survey passed along by GigaOM, uh, 68,000 people have access to HBO Nordic, which makes it one of the least popular paid video services. Uh, well, and worse than that, uh, what did it say? 17,000 people access HBO Nordic yeah. every day. It's actual uh, daily not, users are 17,000. Now compare sure. that to 864,000 Swedes who have access to Netflix and 308,000 who use Netflix every day in Sweden. I mean, I'm not 100% sure on this, uh, Tom, but but I think that Twit might be able to put a tagline, twit.tv, <laughs> more popular than HBO. Nordic. In Norway. <laughs> HBO Nordic in Norway. More popular than HBO Nordic. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, there's a lot of reasons this could be. I mean, it's, it is. It's disappointing to see this and go, oh, but we were so excited. On the other hand, HBO programs are meant for a global audience, but really for a Western audience, for a U.S. audience. That's their, that's their money bags. Maybe they're just not as popular in Norway. Right? I mean, I... Lily Hammer was Netflix's first big original that was made in Scandinavia, and it was not as popular as Orange is the New Black or House of Cards. I don't know. Maybe the movies HBO has on HBO Nordic are, are just not the kind of movies that, that get a lot of uptake, and Netflix did. These are all questions. I don't know if they're true or not. I'll tell you what, here's what's interesting is all the comparisons that we saw were to competing services or to Netflix or whatever. One number we did not see is how many subscribers to HBO full stop there are in Norway and, and uh, or, or HBO Nordic in their That's a really good area. question because HBO just may not be very popular. It just not may not be their thing. Or, or it may not even be available because that's the first reason that pops into mind why oh, HBO would make available. it available. I'm, now right. I feel totally stupid. It's not that's why they were willing to do this experiment because exactly they don't have a presence. Well, and 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 think about that. So in other words, this is an area where HBO has no brand value, no presence, no lodging in the public mind, and they come in with a competitor to Netflix that just offers like less stuff and originals people have never heard of that Sawyer certainly is not putting up with. Uh, the uh, It makes sense that it would do poorly. Now, here's the question. When I read this, I kind of had two different angles on it. On the one, I thought uh, my gut reaction, which I think is wrong, my gut reaction was, man, is HBO really going to let themselves just be bitch slapped in the online arena? Are they just going to retreat back to cable and sit in their cozy shell while the world sets fire all around them? And it's like, I don't believe they're going to do that. But then another part of me says, uh, they open themselves up to a new platform and did astonishingly poorly in it. <laughs> uh, why on earth would they go back to it? So I, I think that the article is correct when it says this is bad news if you want HBO purely in online form in the United States. Um, but I don't think it's the worst news on planet Earth. Yeah, I mean, imagine if NRK, which is the, the Norway television network, came to the U.S. with a, a, an online-only subscription. And they're like, hey, remember Lilyhammer? Now get other great shows like that, plus some movies you've heard of. It, mm -hmm. it might not. So, so yeah, maybe this is actually really good news for HBO that they got some some seventeen thousand daily users. Might be a big win for them. Well, let's, I mean, uh, it's let's, certainly an area that they that they had never had a foothold before. So in that regard, I mean, at least they're, at least they're, whatever. Go go on and continue to experiment, HBO. Just eventually end up with a conclusion that we can all get you without stupid cable. Let's talk about some devices. Let's talk about. The Tube Tops. A segment name that has uh, pretty much become entirely inaccurate uh, as we don't have tubes and you can't really put these things on top of flat panel televisions anymore. But it's about the devices and uh, YouTube app lands on the Xbox One 
A lot of people weren't they were confident that that was really going to happen because the YouTube Windows Phone fight has been going on where Windows Phone makes a YouTube app and then Google comes in and says, no, you're not doing it right. You can't. You got to disallow that. You got to take it out of the store. YouTube on Microsoft uh, Xbox One works great. Let me tell you, Brian, I, I am a little bit smitten with this Xbox One television integration system. Okay, so let's talk about that. But first, to your original point, okay, tube tops, what are we going to call them? Like, like um, screen drops, LCD drops? <laughs> but it's got to be tube tops. And somebody boxes has to send under us a flat picture. panels. <laughs> there you go. Under boxes. boxes. I don't know. It's just, what's funny is I thought tube tops were was racy, but you're just making it worse with <laughs> under boxes. <laughs> no, it's not any better. Uh, all right, so... I am highly, highly curious about the Xbox One because I find myself about to make that decision. I'm going to eventually get both platforms, the PS4 and the Xbox. But the question is, you know, I'm, I'm probably not going to drop $1,000 to get both at the same time. I'm going to get one first. Um, I really, really, really like the pitch of Xbox. I like their ecosystem. I like the Xbox Gold. I like what they're doing with Skype. I love what they're doing with the Xbox Fitness uh, that's free for Xbox Gold members. Um the only thing, the only problem is one of the big selling points is that it integrates with your cable or satellite television and handles that. And as somebody who cut the cord, I, I'm like, I'm like, am I buying into an ecosystem that I no longer belong to? And then I look at uh, PS4, and it's 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 a less familiar space to me, but you know, it is a hundred dollars cheaper. So, tell me what's so great about the Xbox One experience, and I want to know everything from the integration with television to the ability to talk and have it na navigate with a Siri-like experience to get you to do exactly what you want. Yeah, because my, my theory on the Xbox One has been if you're a video gamer and you're likely to already pay for the Xbox Live Gold service, then yeah, sure, this can be your t TV box. Because it is one of the only ones that has Netflix, Hulu, Vudu, and YouTube, and Amazon. Right. The only thing it doesn't have is Apple. Nobody has Apple, but Apple. Right. So it's it's got the closest to being the one box that has everything. But it's also five hundred freaking dollars. Right. That is no comparison to say, oh, well, I'll buy an Apple TV and a Roku and I'll get all those things for two hundred dollars. So so that's my approach to this. And I also thought, well, the integration with the television, it's janky because it's HDMI pass through. It's going to be like Google TV. Let me tell you that that TV integration is genius. Because the Xbox One has something that Google TV didn't. It has other things you want to do. It has yeah. uh, video games. And it has your gamer tag and your friends. And when you realize you can be sitting there watching television, comes to the end of your show, and you're like, oh, I want to I play a video game. I've got the PS4 and I've got the Xbox One, which I do. Well, if I want to play the PS4, this isn't, this isn't a big barrier to entry. I have to pick up my television remote. And I have to change the input to the PS4 and then I have to pick up my PS4 remote and play. Or I can just say, Xbox, play a game. And it will automatically switch it. Even right, though now, that now voice real, recognition real only works 50% of the time in my experience, that's still enough to be like, even if it doesn't work, I still just pick up the remote and I press the Xbox button. And my television stuff keeps playing. Right. It doesn't disconnect me from the service and allows me to look around and go, oh, wait a minute. Actually, I changed my mind. There is something good coming up. Right. It's that seamlessness of continuity. The your television is now just an app on the Xbox and you can be watching TV and have no idea that you've got it going through the Xbox until you need it. And then it just it it's the brilliance of a home theater PC in an Xbox. So this is the kind of thing that on the surface sounds so indulgent and, you know, this is the grandpa moment. Like, what's so bad about leaning over and you can't even pick up on a remote or whatever? But understand, this is the next great barrier for all our devices to conquer. This is why we put up with Siri getting stuff wrong 50% of the time because I don't want to be bothered to pull the phone out of the pocket. I just want to be able to press a button and say, do that thing that I want. Uh, same thing for um, a friend of mine. I never would have thought to buy a Pebble on my own, but John, uh, as a thank you gift, uh, when he left, when, when he when he quit, got me a Pebble, and I love uh, it, man. The ability, the ability to. You know, there's a big difference between just glancing over versus pulling a phone out. Uh, so little things like, and I know you almost want to apologize for not having to reach over and press a button or whatever. That stuff matters, and in fact, on the Xbox 360, I've already been using the integration because I walk in and my kids. 
under you know they 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 ignore the first five times we say it's dinner. I walk in, they're all watching My Little Pony. I don't know where the remote is. I don't care. I just turn, stand right in front of the connect, and say Xbox pause. And then you know I keep shouting it until it works. That's easier because seconds matter, and the closer technology can get to minimizing the impact of those very brief interruptions, the happier all of us will be. And I will pay $500 to have 20 of those little moments eliminated from my life because each one is exactly 10 minutes of, or $10 worth of annoying. And I, in that moment, I would pay $10 and all of a sudden you look at $500. How quickly would that go away? When it's dinner time, seconds matter. That's damn right, dude. That's true. Believe me, I'm not even joking. Uh, it, it's just, it, it is funny, though, and I, I don't apologize for that. I say it the way I say it because I know there's people out there thinking, like, how hard is it? And it's not. I don't want to pretend like it's hard. It's not about that. It's not about whining about something being hard. It's just a reality of if I've got two options, I'm going to pick the easiest one because those seconds yeah. do pile up over the course of the day. Now, PS4 is a better gaming machine. There, there, there are more games I want to play on PS4, especially because they have the indie games like Resogun there. But even then, I'm like, oh, but I've got Forza Motorsport and I'm already in the interface because I'm watching TV. I think that's the genius Trojan horse going on with the Xbox One. I would still tell people, wait, don't buy either one. Let them work out the bugs. Let them update and see where they go with this. But that control of the HDMI pass-through, at least with my direct TV box, works a lot better than I thought it would. And the fact that it doesn't control the DVR doesn't really bother me that much because to me, it's like, oh, but I still have, so I still have to do the thing I used to do to control the DVR, but I was already doing that. So it's all plus that it's like, oh, it's taken away this thing and this thing and this thing. It hasn't taken away that thing yet, but gosh, wouldn't that be nice someday if it added some DVR functionality? Maybe it yeah, will, now, maybe it will and, and is there any justifiable reason why it doesn't have DVR out of the box? I mean, outside of development time, I can imagine because that they they're like, well, we didn't have time for it. they control the interface of the, of the DVR. Google Plus couldn't do that either, right? The interface for the DVR is in the box. So all it can do is it, it, it can send a play and a pause and an up and a down, but it doesn't know what the interface is. It, can't, it doesn't integrate at that level. It can actually pull guide information in and be a guide on the Xbox, right? It can do that because that guide information is independent. But it, DirecTV doesn't let it uh, replace the, direct, the DVR interface. So you've got to use that DVR interface. Couldn't it act like an old-fashioned TiVo and just use the IR blaster to, you know, no, like no, the Xbox No, no, I'm not talking about control. I'm on. talking about the fact that you have to look at the direct TV interface. It's not, it's not about remote at that point. Yes, you can use the Xbox to say, uh, go up, down, press enter. I, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the fact that the Xbox can actually do everything in the Xbox interface. Well, I'll never kick okay, you but, out. But, but again, uh, I, I think you're misunderstanding oh, me. Like, I, like, is there I a reason? I have to pick up the remote and do that. Yeah, for some reason, I couldn't find a button that, that coincided with the DVR button, right? No, so no, I can no, do no, play, no. pause, like, fast forward, and, and re rewind. But to say, hey, Xbox, get me into the listing of my DVR on DirecTV, it, it didn't know how to do that. And no, maybe uh, they'll fix that. St still not hitting the same wavelength. My question is, why can't the Xbox itself record the content? Is there a reason Xbox can't control the system to be at a certain place at a certain time and because record to the, the Xbox's hard drive? It's not. It doesn't. It's not allowed to do that. Yeah, when you say not allowed, is that is that like an HDMI thing? Is that is that like well, a no, copy I'm just protection like thing? The direct or? TV box won't let the Xbox do that. Uh, wait a minute, but the, uh, the direct TV box would never know it's the Xbox changing the channels and, and showing up at the right time. But the, like, the direct like, TV box knows what hard drive is plugged into it. No, 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 no. Okay. Again, um, uh, direct TV box sits there dumb and ignorant. All it sees is IR signals coming in. The right. Xbox One knows you love uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. The Xbox right. One tunes in at 7 p.m. on a Wednesday or whatever night it's on. And the Xbox One takes through the pass-through and records locally on the Xbox One's hard drive. Oh, why, right. Why no, can't that's that, HD. Why can't in other words, can, why can't it hijack the signal? I think or, you can yeah, answer why that can't it just Why can't it just be an independent an independent DVR is what I'm asking. Um, what, why, why can't you use a TiVo with DirecTV? It's the same answer. Okay, well, so that's also the question I want to know. You have, to have, a, you to have know. to have it approved what? for the DirecTV tuner to work with the DVR. Got it. Okay, all right. Yeah, it's, a, it's no different than any other box at that point. 
I mean, you, yeah. you, you, can't, you can't take an independent TiVo and put it on DirecTV. And the only way you can take a TiVo and use it with Comcast is to get a cable card for it. And we've already covered, you know, lots of times that Xbox wants to be that. And in yeah. fact, in Europe, in some places, they are that. But Comcast and DirecTV and none of those, none of those companies are allowing Xbox to be that at this point. Yeah, that's in other words, you're, you're like, why can't it be the 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 tuner and the and the DVR, right? Yes, correct, correct. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. Uh, well, screw you, everyone who hasn't made my dream <laughs> possible. Please hurry <laughs> up and make that happen. Star Trek in film <laughs> foul. Comcast, uh, oh, I'm sorry, not Comcast, Chekhov. I get those two confused. <laughs> uh, uh, Chekhov and, uh, and, and, and Tuvok, actually, uh, Tim Russ, uh, are going to appear in Star Trek Renegades. We've mentioned this before, but they've got a brand new trailer up for Star Trek Renegades. Right. Hey, it looks, before, it looks good. Be before we take a look at this trailer, let me just, uh, let me just share something. Let, I'm going to overshare some personal stuff, and I don't know why. And maybe you've had a similar experience, but I feel... An inordinate, uh, an extreme bond to the character of Chekhov, above all others in the Star Trek universe, uh, specifically because when I was nine years old, I met him at a comic book convention. And, and seeing this article, I went and I found this photo of a nine-year-old Brian Brushwood getting wow. his... Get, <laughs> there's me and Chekhov when I was a kid at some local Texas comic book convention. That's and fantastic. I don't know why... Plus I love the cushions that, on those chairs. Uh, yes, dude, it's eighties as hell up in that. <laughs> but 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 the point is, um, I, I I don't know why that affinity would stick around for so long. But damned if it if it hasn't. And I really I think that's part of why I really enjoyed this trailer. Do we want to take a look at it? Yeah, let's take a look at a little bit of it. It's the same folks that were behind Star Trek of Gods and Men, and as we I, we've been saying, check out Walter Koenig, uh, and Tim Russ will reprise their roles as Chekhov on Tuvok. They they have kind of tacit approval. Uh, to do this, and it should release summer or fall of 2014, uh, and and it's it's fan powered. I mean, it's it's high level production though. This isn't like a bunch of people with cardboard cutouts in their backyard. Um, they've they've done some really good stuff here, and it looks very interesting. It's weird because stylistically, um, it if you were to put this up against, I don't know, we'll say Generations or First Contact, I would say it looks every bit as good in that regard. But but just shy of what we're seeing now in the um, in the level of of the reboot of the Star Trek franchise. Although I really didn't understand the the Transformers effect on the titles, but whatever. Yeah, maybe they're Transformers fans too. Who knows? <laughs> uh, Amazon announced that Alpha House was its most watched show. Over its opening weekend, which wasn't this past weekend, but the weekend before, the number one most watched show on Amazon. We have no idea what that means, uh, yeah, except that Amazon uh, says. Peter Kafka makes a good point of saying, look, that's not news. You would <laughs> expect it to be number one because you advertised the hell out of it. And also, what else are, are people going to be watching? Like literally an ad before every single thing you watched on Amazon Prime was for Alpha House. The only way this is news is is if it wasn't your number one, in which case that's probably not something you're going to want to tout. So I guess, who knows I mean, what I that guess means. Maybe, maybe Breaking Bad or Walking Dead or something might have been reasonably understandable to be number one. Uh, but you're right. Like, this is a brand new show that you shoved into people's faces and it has John Goodman. So a lot of people are like, yeah, sure, all right. And I guess that's a good thing. It means that people on Amazon Instant respond the same way they do to broadcast television. I see a promo for something, I'm going to check it out. I'm going to give it a flyer, see what it's like. They think of it the same way. So that that yeah. could be a, a positive. Uh, Beef us... points out from the chat room. Beef says, uh, breaking news, pop star sells lots of albums. <laughs> Which yeah. is like, yes, again, that's that's the expected. That's the null <laughs> hypothesis. Pop star says, my new album is my number one best-selling album right now. <laughs> exactly. All right. Let's ready check to move on scam. to scam lines? <laughs> Ah, the classic. Some people actually wrote in and 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 said, expressed their support for the old scan line. So uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll just. Sorry, that one's dead and buried. You better send it a new one. If you want a pop music parody, then send it, it on in. 
Let's start with Sony shrinking their movie division in order to keep it alive. Uh, in other words, Sony has uh, been subject to a lot of scrutiny over their mu movie business. And this isn't just because of television and, and movie industry stuff. A lot of this has to do with Sony particularly. But according to the LA Times, a further $100 million in cuts are expected to be identified by a consulting firm. And Sony plans to increase transparency and accountability around the group. So fewer people, what was fewer things coming out of it. What was really interesting to me is that specifically this article, I don't know if Sony specifically mentioned it, but I, I would imagine not given the nature of it, but this article specifically mentions what a bomb uh, Smurfs 2 was and uh, and a couple, a White House Down was supposed to be the big summer blockbuster, but totally evaporated. Uh, they and, and, it's, and somebody over Twitter asked us if this was a case of Lucas's and Spielberg's prediction coming true. Do you, do you, yes or no, since you're out of time? No. Because okay, good. Sony. <laughs> no, because Sony. That works for me. Uh, all right, Amazon inks an exclusive streaming deal with New York-based film company company A24. A24 specifically, you know, there weren't a lot of details on this. Were you familiar with A24's uh, background going into this? No, I, I, I mean, I, I know the movies they've created. I, I, I'm not... Like, oh, A24, they make all my favorite movies or anything like that. Uh, but they distribute finance and produce feature length stuff. Sofia Coppola's The Bling Ring, James Ponsult's The Spectacular Now. So this is just another mile marker along the way. It's Amazon getting a deal that Netflix didn't get for some mostly indie art house movies. But those are kind of movies tend to be popular on streaming services. This is another one of those Monopoly board stories that we hit from time to time. This is somebody landing landing on... A24 and uh, paying $500. You sunk to own my it. battleship movie. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and they don't, by the way, Amazon movie. Prime Instant Video doesn't get them until after they hit DVD and Blu ray, if that makes any difference to you. Yeah. Right on. Hey, Chromecast got HBO Go since we last talked to you. You might have noticed this already. You can get an iOS and Android HBO Go app that have the little Chromecast button on it now. So that brings Chromecast up to having Pandora, Hulu Plus, Netflix, and YouTube. They don't have Amazon but that or Vudu, but it, Chromecast is beefing up. It's getting more channels. Let me tell you, man, you want to put Chromecast into perspective. Like when I bought an iPhone, somebody said like, well, now you have a choice. You can either get a case for that iPhone or you can buy a Chromecast. And that was like brain explosion. When, when, well, and you when know, your streaming service costs less than a case for a phone, then you're in a good spot. Yeah, it totally is a, a good spot. And, and, and I think it's a different sort of thing than a set-top box when you actually use it. But we end up using it for YouTube all the time. Don't use it so much for Netflix anymore because I don't want to have to change the input. Changing the input, man. Why is that so hard for me? I got, I got to get therapy or something. Much more expensive than a Chromecast is an Apple TV, which recently updated, which, by the way, is, is $15 more expensive or right. half again as expensive, if you right. want to phrase it that way. Apple Isn't TV it $99 update for adds Apple TV? Anyway, uh, I, I don't know. I thought it was like 60 bucks for the cheapest one. I don't know. Uh, Apple it's... TV update adds Yahoo screen and PBS apps. Uh, again, this is another side of the Monopoly board extravaganza. It's great that they're bringing this in there. Um, when you get the Yahoo app, uh, you're going to be able to see clips from Saturday Night Live, the Colbert Report and the Daily Show. Man, I, the moment I see clips, but also just in, in originals, they're also going to have yeah. Yahoo originals, some of which may be hosted by Katie Couric now. That's true. That's true. Uh, imagine being able to sit down and watch uh, the Yahoo Evening News every day with Katie Couric. I mean, we don't think of Yahoo as being the one that has this, but it only takes a couple hits. And maybe it'll be Katie Couric, maybe it won't, for people to go, oh, I have to have the Apple TV so I can, I can watch this on my television because I really like that new show from Yahoo or whatever. As crazy as that Could sounds be. now. <laughs> DirecTV is going to stream 30 live television channels outside the home. This is... Uh, a TV everywhere type of story. So they will deliver 100 live TV in-home streaming channels. So I have direct TV. If I wander around the house with my iPad, I can watch 100 channels on my iPad. Don't have to be in the room with the box or whatever. But there'll be 30 channels I can watch when I'm just out at the coffee shop, when I'm anywhere in the world, frankly. That's yeah, nice. Yeah, already, I can't, I, and I guess, did, uh, <laughs> do we know, did, did Time Warner ever adjust their policy or, or their channels are still, you have to be on the home Wi-Fi? You're the Time Warner bland person. Right. Not, not, not anymore. I'm out. I, I extradited yeah, I don't myself live, I, Well, I guess gulag. I do live in Time Warner land, don't I? 
I live in the yeah. region of Time Warner. Uh, this, I, I think this is interesting because it's an attempt for them to say, hey, look at this. You can now like do something outside. I'm like, I got a sling box. I can do all of my channels outside all the time. And guess what? I can also use my DVR outside, which this doesn't have on demand. So I'm not sure yeah, how you- Welcome start. to five years ago, jerks. Yeah, go on. Uh, Walmart selling Google's Chromecast streaming stick. Uh, have you heard of this Google- Chromecast. We should have paired stick, this up. We Tom? should have ordered. I should have ordered this better. I apologize. <laughs> but yeah, Chromecast. Uh, Chromecast selling at Walmart. I think that yeah, when you talk about thirty five dollars, people going on a Walmart like, oh, big deal. Thirty five dollars HDMI. Just plug it into my television. I get all this stuff. Yeah, they're going to sell a ton of those things. Are you imagine, me? imagine if you're the type of person who's buying stuff for Christmas at Walmart and you see a Chromecast, a Google product. Uh, and I don't even know if the Apple product is there. Let's say you see a Chromecast, a Roku, and a uh, Apple TV at thirty-five, sixty, and ninety-nine dollars. I'm going to say that that the Google brand is almost not quite where Apple is, but it's almost there. And at at a third of the price, I got to imagine that they're very well positioned to do well in the hol holiday season. I think you're right, and I think that brings us to the end of another successful scan lines. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your service. We can <laughs> just, I could tell you totally you you thought you were gonna say thank you for scan lines and you were gonna hear which which is scan lines and then it didn't happen and you just heard ticking as you just waited for something. I was to just happen. I was like we don't have to wait for the the thing, but now yeah. no we spent more time talking about it than we would have had if I had just moved on and said let's do the winter movie draft. <laughs> Hunger Games catching. Fire indeed, Ooh, Brian. My goodness. You know what? The moment we did that auction, I had a really strong feeling about just Robert Young. And um, the big question, of course, was would the second movie live up to the hype of the first movie? Would the fact that it's in the middle of the late fall, almost winter, impact the money it makes? Catching Fire, the sequel to the $408 million blockbuster Hunger Games, uh, it, it, it already broke records. Hunger Games did around $150 million opening weekend. This one did $158 million opening weekend, setting a record in November and setting uh, Justin. I mean, if this one performs like the original Hunger Games, the first one, then we are looking at uh, freaking uh, 400 plus million for this movie alone, plus the 80 plus million he got for Bad Grandpa, putting him well over $500 million and still... Uh, one more movie out of the furnace. I mean, who knows what that's going to make. But all of a sudden, you get a clearer picture of what the end game is going to look like. Justin, of course, is number two right now in the rankings behind Casey McKinnon. I have a feeling that one week from now, Justin's going to be in first place and be there for the rest of the game. Yeah, you may be right about that. I mean, $158 million out of the gate is nothing to sneeze at. Now, granted, $245 million for gravity is nothing to sneeze at either. But Hunger Games is going to have a strong second weekend. You can almost guarantee it. Uh, even if it only gets half, that's... Put, that puts it close enough uh, to, to say, yeah, he just he just needs to pile on those extras. I would like to point out that Delivery Man uh, just about got $8 million, 7.944. Uh, <laughs> You're doing great, buddy. You and me, thanks, we're going to come from behind. I, at this point, I would be willing to bet that if we merged our rosters and, and became a team holding hands for the rest of we the competition, we would still so, not win. <laughs> Yeah, in fact, Casey's even got a movie that, out this week. Old Boy is hers, and Father Robert Balasser has Frozen, uh, both of those coming up. Neither one of them are game changers, but every little bit helps, and Casey's got three more movies to pile on on top and try to pad her lead on Justin and, and, and fend him off. Uh, I mean, so really it's for pretty much all Hunger Games for Justin at this point. For, hot, for Father Robert to win uh, Frozen plus The Wolf of Wall Street, if that those together do three hundred million, that would place him at four hundred and sixty-seven million, which would at least put him in striking distance. But uh, but I'm not optimistic. I mean, I think the Wolf of Wall Street is something that's got Oscar buzz on it, but is not going to blow us away with you know one hundred and eighty million or anything. That's a nutty. that's a movie that's going to make Father Robert a lot of money after it wins an Oscar in March, but it will be too yes. late for the movie draft. Sadly. <laughs> exactly. Possibly. Exactly. Yeah. Let's talk about what we're watching. <laughs> watching how's that over the air antenna treat you brian brushwood oh mg remember last week i got an email from somebody saying hey bro 
what you're going to do when an asteroid smashes all your cellular towers and takes away your cable internet. How are you going to get important safety information? And I panicked. So I immediately went to Amazon and bought a, uh, I think it's like a, a leaf, I want to say. It's it's on it's one way. of those really, it's a, it's yeah, a thin flat square one. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have one of those too. And it, it was stupidly easy to set up. We popped mm -hmm. it in. We got uh, we got like 14 channels. Um, we got, you know, both the standard def and high def feeds for, uh, you know, the big four. We also got a version of NHK from uh, Japan and uh, in like three or four, I think we get a, a, a Spanish stations, including one that appears to be uh, uh, sports only. But the weird part is, is like I felt good of checking off that part of my life, you know, like, OK, no matter what. When my in-laws come over and want to watch the game or what's on TV, I don't even know what's on TV at any time. I have no idea what day of the week or whatever. Uh, like they they can watch that. So to me, I did it as like a public service, like as a public good. Fine. Other people can watch TV now if you're too dumb to know how to, you know, access everything through Netflix. Well, now now uh, you got to get yourself a little DVR box hooked up to that thing. And then, oh, then you can at, actually yeah. record stuff. Yeah, no, no, and and I and I'm down for that, and I want to get back into the TiVo ecosystem. But but the problem is, I don't know of any broadcast television that I want to watch in the living room because what's weird now, and and this is something I don't think we've talked about, is watching television in the living room when you have kids becomes a different proposition because uh, whatever we watch in the living room can be heard through most of the house. Whereas if I watch it in my office, it's 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 relatively private. So it's like. You know, it's uh, there are times that we full on have uh, Game of Thrones on the DVR in the living room, but we won't watch it there. I'll go and buy it for three or I guess you can't buy Game of Thrones. Um, uh, we'll say Walking Dead or whatever. There have been times that I have that I have had a legitimate copy in the other room, but paid again to, for a downloaded copy so I could watch it in my office relatively privately. So I don't know how much value there is to any of that. The only people who well, watch it all the time are the kids, and they're watching right. you're, you're acting as if this is the land of 2003, when your TiVo can only record the one, one or two things at a time and only watch them on that. Get a Romeo, and then you can watch oh. those things on your, on your freaking phone if you want to anywhere. Get a Slingbox. Uh, get, or, get, or what was the one we were talking about last week? Uh, the the low blow. No, well, that's a, that's definitely not. <laughs> that's the that's, name that's of what's going to take over tube tops. <laughs> tube tops is being replaced with the low blow. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, Tableau. It was called Tableau. As, Tableau, as a, right? Yeah, and that allowed you to watch it on, on smartphone apps and stuff. And there's definitely options that will let you overcome that problem, so that you can record over the air stuff and watch it wherever you want. Well, I'll tell you what it's is interesting is there's still there's a number of things that we can stream over a computer interface, but still can't send like I'm still trying to decide on what set top box to get for the living room. And and for the stuff we're watching, there keeps not being a solution for it. For example, we decided to get caught up on The Legend of Korra, which all the episodes are available for streaming of season two right now at uh, Nick.com. Uh, but, you know, none of as as far as I know, there would be no streaming option to use any of those set top boxes. So instead, I just grabbed my laptop, walked over, yanked the HDMI cable out of the Xbox, plugged it into the to the uh, laptop and was able to stream. Uh, I think we watched all but the last two episodes. Fascinating stuff. If you're not watching, uh, go experience Legend of, of, of or I'm sorry, uh, Avatar The Last Airbender and then Legend of Korra. So good. All of it's so good. The storytelling, the animation, it's just delightful. Um, but uh, but that's about it. all I, I got to really watch. That and a little more season four of Archer. Well, I fulfilled my obligation and watched an episode of The Shield last night on the Xbox One right after playing some Forza Motorsport in the Amazon uh, app. Uh, so we could talk a little bit about that spoiler zone if you want. Yeah, well, in fact, I was thinking we might try something different on Spoiler Zone because I did not watch the Doctor Who special this weekend, but I want very much, I'm not going to because we don't have cable right now and I don't feel like grabbing oh, okay. it, uh, but I would love to have you walk me through it and tell me what was great about it. You want to do that in the Spoiler Zone? I guess. You know, that way I don't, I don't have to worry about saying something inappropriate uh, to someone who wants to still watch it. Uh, and I watched The Walking Dead. I was absolutely right. Do not watch The Walking Dead this week, <laughs> Ryan. Uh, All right, if, thanks. If my feeling is right, uh, how can I say this without being spoilery to those who still want to watch the two Governor episodes? You can skip these two episodes, and if I'm right, next week's episode, you can just watch that one because you're caught up to the two Governor episodes, right? You haven't watched the sure. two Governor episodes, but you've watched everything else. 
I think yeah. all you need to know is, oh, the governor changed a lot and then changed back, and now he's the governor again. Now let's watch next week's episode of The Walking Dead. Okay. All right. Well, that's fine by me. That's not much of a spoiler. I'm okay with that. Yeah. Uh, right um, on, man. Well, <clears throat> and Dr. Who. Uh, so. oh, okay. Yeah. We'll wait. We'll wait till spoiler zone for anything more on that. Feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. We got time for a couple of pieces of feedback. One from Sean, who says MLB's threat about moving to cable has to be the emptiest threat in the history of empty threats. Guess how many games my local team, the Twins, have on broadcast. Wait, stop counting. You're too high. They have zero games on broadcast. I think MLB would prefer if Area 1. Cable contracts are very lucrative, and anything to increase subscriber numbers will benefit the teams. Yeah, the Dodgers here don't show up on broadcast all that often either and i know that's true in, in most of the markets it was true of the giants as well yeah man uh followed up with uh from jack tom and brian have heard you talk about hulu plus on previous episodes and you did so on your most recent frame rate i know you say you don't see why anyone would pay for hulu plus so i thought i'd give you my two cents netflix has the most content and a lot of back episodes of tv or movies while amazon prime has some decent content but i use that mostly to purchase episodes of current shows that aren't streaming or to rent movies hulu is a nice compliment because of the availability of current episodes of a lot of shows I watch. I know that you can watch a lot of the same shows <laughs> through network websites or Hulu in a browser. I still pay for Hulu for the convenience. I like staying in the PS3 for all of my streaming needs without having to connect my laptop to the TV. And by the way, Tom, this goes right back to what you were talking about with the Xbox One. There is a value to staying in a certain ecosystem. You don't want to have to load up another thing and go somewhere else. And this is a case where somebody's totally willing to shell out a few bucks in order to do that. Uh, this is also true of the bedroom where I have a Roku connected to the bedroom TV. So I watch all the streaming services as well between Netflix and Hulu. There are very few shows that I need to purchase individual episodes of, and I don't need any other hardware in the bedroom, uh, snip some stuff out. And he says, uh, I will say that I haven't spent much time using Hulu in the browser, but switching back and forth between my laptop and TV for different services just sounds annoying. Eh, I'm going to kind of write that off. It's like, you can't not do a thing and then say it sounds annoying. Although that's exactly what you and I are doing with Hulu Plus, <laughs> ironically well, enough. No, actually, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, it, are, do, do we have more to pass no, along? No, no, I mean, it's, it's all wrap up after that. That's fine. Because I, I, I totally understand what Jack's talking about, and it's all a personal decision, right? I, I just don't see that $8 a month just so I don't have to airplay is worth it. Some people may, yeah. they may, they may be, you may be exactly right, Brian, like that collision of two inconveniences for some people, they may go, actually, the inconvenience of paying $8 a month is only a one-time inconvenience. And then I forget about it. And I don't have to think about the fact that, Hey, it's on Hulu plus what I could do. What stops me from saying, yeah, that's totally fine for me too, is the fact that there will be things that I want to watch on Hulu that aren't available on Hulu plus, even though I'm paying for it. And I can yes. go to my laptop and watch them on Hulu and airplay them and watch them on my TV. So at that point, I start to back up and go, well, now I'm just paying for extra inconvenience. I'm paying for the fact that I have to be confused, whereas I can keep it simpler by just using Hulu on my laptop and airplaying it. And you may say, well, I don't have an Apple TV. I don't want an Apple TV. So that's not a solution for me. Sure. Absolutely true. Maybe there's a DLNA solution for you. Maybe there's not. And so that changes the calculus for different people. I understand that as well. But yeah, for me, I mean, I watch Hulu a lot. I actually don't have a problem with the Hulu service. I don't think that it makes sense for me to pay money just so I can watch it on a particular screen in my house when I can when I can make it go on to any screen I want with a little extra effort. But that's me. That's a totally different situation. Yeah, I uh, we we are a household that has been on and off of Hulu Plus a couple of times right now. So Bonnie's the one who loves it and then gets annoyed with it and drops it and goes back to it. Uh, I I think I've watched maybe a sum total of of less than ten programs on Hulu Plus ever. So it, again, I'm still waiting for the pitch to to come in front of me. Uh, there have been says, more. I there have been more shows. Sorry, just one more thing. There have been more shows showing up on Hulu, not. Hulu Plus. I don't know if they're on Hulu Plus or not. They've been right. showing up on Hulu, like the Avengers classic series, not the superheroes, but the British spies. Uh, sure. They've got a season of that. And Father Ted, I've been watching Father Ted off and on, and that's only available on Hulu. So I'm getting, getting pulled back into Hulu, and I think that's great. 
I don't want anything to pay just to put it on my TV when I could put it on my TV on my own. Sure. Uh, Trey says, I don't listen to pop music often. So when I hear your bumper music, all I hear is the actual, or I hear the actual song. Now, when I hear the real tune, my brain overlays scan lines, ha. bumper lyrics instead. Nice. Uh, Trey, that's I'm delightful. That. That's great. Uh, sorry, it's dead and buried. It's gone. It's behind us, much like the summer of 2013. So let's start looking forward to a new show, a uh, new uh, song for us to weird out Yankovic into wicky, something. Wicky, wicky. That we can listen to. Alan wrote in and said, I sent an email to TNT about how I think Tom is on to something about how people resent being forced to sign up for a different service. I think many in the tech media don't realize how much people invest in their online identity and their community there. Think of it this way. A bunch of Catholics are told that if they want to continue to attend service at their church, they will have to convert to Presbyterian. I'm not sure that that's an analogous situation. You're bringing no, religion. and in fact, that's, that's why I put... Uh, look, look, I want to give everyone a fair voice here, and Alan does seem passionate sure. in this position. Personally, I think it's a bit much for me. It's, you know, there was another email that said, the problem is people don't want to have Google Plus forced down their throats. And I really think that's it. You know, they, for good or ill, whether they're right or wrong, you may or may not agree with them. They think Google Plus is an inferior social network that they don't want to have anything to do with. And it's being forced upon them as a YouTube user. I think that is the nut of the problem. Uh, this one live from the chat room just now, Furniture Guy says... Ace Detect Scam School, Brian. The feedback bumper is the one you need to change. It makes me cringe every time. What? I can't speak. Heresy. I can't speak for Tom, but I have no intention of ever changing that delightful I, feedback song. See, Furniture Guy, this is we can disagree on things and still get along because I agree with Brian. I, I'm not with you on that on that one. Uh, hey, uh, do we? If we have enough time, can we chime in on this article from Business Insider that a yeah, bunch of people just, have sent over to us? I was going to finish up with that. Uh, the Dutch Slayer pointed this out to me on Twitter, but we got, well, I don't know, a good three or four people sent it to us an email. It's a Business yep. Insider link called TV is Dying and Here are the Stats that Prove It. Now, they have an agenda there, obviously, and they spin all these stats a lot. And you could probably look at a lot of these stats and pull good things out and show how TV is surviving. But if you go past the, the slant of the presentation, this is actually a really good compilation of lots of good stats about how many people are subscribing to what? How many people are streaming what? What the Nielsen numbers are for homes? What the sports numbers are? So if you're looking for, for a source of numbers, this is a good place to go. Yeah, I guess all you need to do is search Google for Business Insider Death of TV. I'm sure it'll be the first thing that pops TV up. TV is dying. But like, Who's buying? Looking at the number of cable video subscribers starting in uh, Q1 2010 all the way to Q3 2013 where you're going from – you know, 44 and a half thousand, uh, or yeah, uh, down to 40,000. I don't even know the context of these numbers, but they are, it's some damning evidence that it makes me feels like it's a good time to have a whole show about watching what you want, when you want, and whatever damn device you seems please. like. Yeah, it seems like things are continuing to flow that way. Uh, so tell your friends about frame rate. We'll stream live every Monday at 3 30 Pacific, 6 30 p.m. Eastern at live.twit.tv. You can also subscribe to our podcast, get our show notes and all that stuff at twit.tv slash FR. We have a YouTube channel. You can, if you want to watch it on YouTube, you can subscribe there as well, youtube.com slash twit frame rate. You can email us frame rate at twit.tv. And of course, just think warm thoughts and send us hugs in your brain anytime you want. No, you can't do that. You have to give us actual hugs. Virtual hugs That's are no good to me. Right here. Give me a real hug. Come on. No. How about I hug you with a little uh, spoiler zone drop? What do you think? Yeah! yeah. <laughs> Silent Breed is people! Silent Breed. Wait, no. This is uh, going to be a lot of fun for me, Tom, because so you realize what, what, this is a different spoiler zone in that you're going to tell me about the Doctor Who show because I'm not going to watch it, but I do want to know how it goes. Uh, I want you to spoil me, and the other one will be um, a show that that I've only rewatched, uh, man, maybe maybe six months ago. But I'm really curious to get your your take on which one do you want to hit up first. Let's do the Shield first. Okay. Uh, so, so so you watch the first episode, she which yeah, the Shield. Uh, and by the way, uh, I already got just after us talking about watching the Shield and talking about it on the show, I got at least one person on Twitter. Who just wrapped up like season five and just like brain explosion? Oh, I can't wait for you to catch up. So that's exciting. But but uh, for those of you who don't know, and this is spoilery, uh, the very first episode of the Shield ends with 
a main character, you know, a, a kind of gray area cop who gets the job done, by the way, at the end of the episode, turns around and murders a partner in cold blood. So the um, the first thing that you see, and by the way, they, they pulled a fantastic trick on that first episode in that they listed that partner in the credits. Like he was fully credited through all the the union, whatever it is. So to have his name be in the credits, not like guest starring this week, but like here's he's a member of the team. And then they just shoot him in the face, literally shoot him in the face at the end of the episode. It It is I have couched it as the inverse of Breaking Bad. In that Breaking Bad, you have a well-beloved, sympathetic character who starts to touch on a naughty path, and the rest of the of the series is you watching him descend. This is the reverse, in that you have a cop that you think you want to like who, from episode one, is utterly and completely damned. He is the bad guy. You are left with no question about it after the very first episode. And then everything from then sort of meanders into like, well, I don't know. I kind of understand where he's coming from. So watching the second episode, uh, first of all, what did you think of the first episode and did the second episode sway you one way or the other? Yeah, I actually didn't think of uh, Mackie as being all that evil, actually. I, I felt like he was very self-centered and certainly amoral, right? Certainly a psychopath because he was willing to shoot the journeyman's brother. And I'm like, but you're the thing. Come on, man. You can't be like that. Uh, <laughs> but honestly, I didn't, I didn't look at this episode and think that it was The Wire by any stretch. I looked at that no, first episode and I thought, okay, this is this is an edgy procedural cop show, probably a lot edgier then than it is now because we've had, you know, time go. Uh, and it's interesting, but there's nothing here making me that interested. Even the shooting of the partner, I'm like, that nah, doesn't surprise me. I'm not, I'm not saying I saw it coming per, per se, but I also sort of saw that kind of thing coming. I'm like, oh, they did that faster. Okay. I was not shocked, even though, and I wasn't like, I knew it was happening. I wasn't spoiled or anything. I was like, all right. So you've got Mrs. Frederick uh, from Warehouse 13 as an investigator. She's pretty good. And you got the thing as a bad guy. Uh, and we're not going to, the journeyman guy's gone now. So I've got to get invested in something and I'm not sure what, because I feel like I've seen this story before. Okay. That was episode one and why I didn't immediately go watch episode two. Uh, right. Episode two starts to bring me into the characters more. And uh, so Mrs. Frederick and the weenie guy who has people play tricks on him start to show themselves as capable interrogators. And that makes that guy more interesting because the first episode, they just played a lot of pranks on him. And you're like, oh, so this is the guy they beat up all the time. But then he right. goes hardballs against Mackie and, uh, and, 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 the, and, and his other associate. Shane. And I'm like, right. all right. So he actually, I mean, he showed a little bit of that in episode one, but I'm getting it. Like he's good at something. That's yeah, what he's no, good uh, at. Uh, Dutch, Dutch is a is is gifted and incredibly smart, um, but also flawed, uh, as are most of the characters in it. And, and I'm glad you picked up on that now because that's a theme you'll see moving forward as as well. Um, all and right, then you, so, bring, sorry. you bring in the religious guy, and he gets hazed. That felt like episode one, like. All right, we've got to have the somewhat innocent guy have his innocence supposed to be one of the guys. And, and oh, the woman's there and she feels uncomfortable. All right, that, well, whatever. But I feel like what I'm reacting to is a lot of these set pieces need to be put in place to be subverted. Uh, and not that I felt I got that in episode two, but I could see that they're like trying to be like, not everything is going to be as it seems, but we need you to think, we need you to feel that way before we can pull yeah. the rug out from under you. Uh, so I, I was, I liked episode two more. It's still, it's a first season, so I'm not going to be too harsh on it, but it hasn't gripped me yet. Yeah, no, that's fine. And and I don't know that it did for me at that point either. You know, it's it's hard for me to go back and remember a decade ago when I first watched those yeah. first few episodes. I, I think it may have taken a few episodes before I got all the way into it, but I suspect you'll get there pretty quick. And understand, it's not The Wire. The Wire is social commentary that'll change your life and the way you understand the way bureaucracies happen. This is an action show about agonizing choices and people who you just wonder what they're going to do next. Uh, Breaking Bad owes a very, very deep debt to The Shield. And, uh, and in that regard, I, I just can't wait for you to get a few more episodes in to where once you have a handle on all the characters, then you really see the chessboard and you understand the maneuverings and the difficulties uh, with, with, with doing it. Because right now it feels like a really good T.J. Hooker. 
uh, which I just watched for autopilot, so I can say that unironically. <laughs> like, okay. like TJ Hooker is was trying to be the same kind of show that The Shield yeah. is in the first two episodes, uh, yeah. and and actually succeeded far better than I remembered having gone back and watched the pilot. Like, the uh, only we think thing of it I as remember. a joke about Shatner now, but they're, they're, they yeah. were really trying to be like, this is what LA cops are really like. They certainly didn't succeed nearly as well as the shield did. Uh, so, but that, that's where I'm coming at it from right now. And I'm, and so the second episode, I hadn't watched TJ Hooker after the first, after the second, I'm like, well, this is certainly much grittier than that. <laughs> all right. So, okay. Walk me through the doctor who's special. First of all, I all right. hear phenomenal, phenomenal mm-hmm. things about the web webisode that led up to it. Are we, are we getting off there? No, I just yeah. let making people know. Okay. All right. What, were you going to finish that? Oh, you went no, mute. No, oh, no, I'm I'm listening. I'm I'm okay. all done. You want me to walk yeah. you through it? Um, yeah. No, no, no. Tell 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 me. Just just tell me. Tell it to me like we're uh, it's it's gym class, and you realize that I that it's pre DVRs, and I this the closest I'll ever get to this because I didn't see it last night is you telling it to me. Yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't feel up to that. I can't. <laughs> All right, Honestly, fine. Tell me what you like felt about the whole it. thing. What I will say is this is fan service. This is 100% you are a fan of the reboot of Doctor Who and you're going to love it. If you're a fan of the classic and the reboot of Doctor Who, and I know it's not technically a reboot, but you know, the the modern version versus the, the older resumption, version. Resumption, sure. You're going to absolutely love it. Uh because what they did was Moment by moment, just boom, boom, boom. Here's David Tennant back, for those of you like me who really like David Tennant. And he's being David Tennant, and he's saying things, and we put words in his mouth that you wanted to hear him say, and famous lines came out again, and things that he talked about get revealed, like his marriage to Elizabeth I, and all of this stuff happens, and you're like, God, it's so great to see David Tennant back. But now he's interacting with Matt Smith, and what would that be like? And oh my gosh, it's like the two captains from Star Trek met, right? It's that, it's that level for Doctor Who fans, and that's what this entire show was about. It was saying, we're going to fill in the gaps of the mythology for you people. We're going to have quirky, weird history story. We're going to have dramatic Gallifrey time war. And we're going to have the doctors all meeting. And at the very end, we're going to actually tie in every single doctor, including one who hasn't become a doctor yet, Peter Capaldi, into this storyline so that you are just as a fan as an already existing fan, going to be standing and cheering. I was talking to Justin Robert Young on text message right after it. And I was like, I was trying to be like, okay, don't be too fanboy. I love the beginning. I love the end. It was like the Avengers feeling. I had a smile on my face the whole way. There were some middle parts where I'm like, I wish there were more time more in this. Justin Robert Young was like, unreservedly, awesome job. Very well done. Can't believe they, how, how well they did and they killed it. And that started to make me go, maybe I'm being too critical about it. But yeah, well, there, there were some problems with the, with the plot line. But if you if you want a show with that doesn't have problems in the plot line, you don't watch Doctor Who. That's that's right. that's not what it's about. So this is the ultimate fan film, and that webisode with Paul McGann tying in was just a taste of what you were going to get in this thing because it hit on all the cylinders. If if and it hit on probably hit on things that I don't even get because it was that yeah. deep in the lore of this television show. That's awesome. Well, maybe I will go ahead and see it now that I've heard such awesomeness about it. Well, and are uh, you mainly because up? it sounds I mean, like I would um, yeah, watch we, we it. Watch, we watch this up. most recent. We watch this most recent season. Most of it. I I, I think I just uh, I I saw something shiny and didn't watch the last like four or five see, episodes. But I don't of know if season. you're going to like this episode that much because you don't have that history of Chris Eccleston and David Tennant. You oh no! I've all seen those. all of those. Yeah, no, no, oh, you, no. you I, have. I, I, okay, that's what I meant when well, you caught I, I watched, so you I watched all. I watched all the Christopher Eccleston's. I've seen you know a few of the highlights of of um, David Tennant's days okay. and and seen all of the Matt Smith stuff. Uh, okay. And of course, you know, and and I am that that kid who watched on PBS in second grade. You know, uh, uh, back when they would split up. On PBS, they would split up a single episode of Doctor Who into four 15-minute episodes that would play every night at 6 o'clock while we had dinner. Uh, so it's like, yeah, I remember all the all the Tom Baker days and, okay. and the, the Peter Davidson and so on. Then I think you'll enjoy it. Whether you'll love it or not, I'm not sure because you're not loving the current one. You're liking the current one. Uh, yeah. The one thing I will say is you do get Tom Baker in this. And the way they do it is a little contrived 
But the second time I watched it, I've watched this thing three times. The second time I watched it, it I, w- I was critical. I was like, I'm not sure I like the way they did that. And I'm like, no, it passed my test. That's like, I'm like, yeah. it, they, 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 they crafted it perfectly to fit into that universe. Uh, so I think you might get a kick out of that too. Right on. Well, dude, I'm very excited to hear that. And that's maybe that's something, you know, uh, it was one year ago, just about next month that I first introduced my daughter to Doctor Who with the Christmas special. So maybe uh-huh. this will be a good uh, button to come back and watch this and for me to explain a bunch of stuff to her. You can watch that and then there'll be, a, there'll be a Christmas special again. Uh, it'll be Matt Smith's last episode. So right on. Yeah. Well, cool. I also thought Veronica Belmont did a fine job hosting the pre and post show on BBC America. I so don't just, know how I missed that. Somehow I didn't get the tweet or I wasn't watching Twitter at the right moments, but all of a sudden everyone's congratulating Veronica. And I was just like, wait, what? She was on TV. And I was yeah, like, well, let me just, TV, and then TV. I realized, and then I realized that, uh, that I didn't have cable and I couldn't watch. And so for the well, first time, I genuinely regretted they actually well, showed yes. more on YouTube than they showed on on television. So you would have seen Which even everyone more. Everyone made sure to tell me after right. it was already over. So <laughs> so I I was bummed that I missed that whole thing. I think it might even be on demand somewhere. I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, just wanted to throw that in there. So there you go. That's my spoilers. Right on, man. We'll do. Well, and you know what I'm going to do Veronica. now? I'm going to go to the theater and watch the 3D version of the 50th anniversary episode. Really. Yeah, because they shot it in 3D, and there are particular plot points involving 3D paintings that are apparently amazing in 3D. So, gonna go see it again. Right on. Well, uh, enjoy it a third time. Uh, I'm dude, crazy. good, good episode of Frame Rate. Good episode of yes, the Spoiler agree. Zone. Great chatting with you as always, Tom. Of course, I agree too. I really like doing this show. It's fun time. Yeah, me too. Let's 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 abandon our plan to set fire to this show. Let's Instead, not. let it continue forever. Right. <laughs> when seconds matter is our title. I yeah. love that. John I Jason, that was, was that you? Yeah. Smart. It came up a couple of times. I thought it was it's uh, intriguing. When seconds count. <laughs> yeah. All right, All right beautiful folks. people. I'm going to go and fill orders. We're down to uh we got over 600 orders at scamstuff.com uh over our sale. And wow. now we're down to only 130 left to fill. So I'm going to do probably another, um, I don't know, another 30 or 40 tonight. It's fulfilling, it's isn't it? It's brutal. I mean, it's a lot of fulfillment. <laughs> it's draining to be so fulfilling, it yeah, turns out. Exactly. <laughs> I can see that. All, All right, right. See you guys. All right, guys.